Thank you. I'll say, Bill, that the best thing that ever happened to me is the media and the publicity departments deciding not to refer to you as a science fiction writer anymore, because it opened up an ecological niche for me to move into. And I'm very, very grateful for that, as is my accountant. So I'm thrilled to be here tonight in conversation with you. We were just reminiscing, Bill and I, about Toronto of old back in the green room there. Bill lived here uh, 40 years ago and uh, now lives, as you know, in Vancouver. We're going to talk a little bit about that as that goes on. But the Canadianness is significant because I've been charged with a duty that I have to perform before we get into this. Uh, there's, for 30 years now, there have been Canadian Science Fiction and Fantasy Awards known as the Aurora Awards. And Bill has been repeatedly nominated for said awards and won said awards. And in honor of the 30th anniversary at conventions across Canada last year, Aurora Award nominee pins were presented. They're lovely pins that show a little silhouette or a profile of the trophy. And Bill did not show up at any of these science fiction conventions to collect his 30th anniversary pin. So uh, I have promised the Canadian Science Fiction and Fantasy Society to pin you tonight. And here you are, sir, if you want to put this on. Careful of the thing there, and there's one of these little grommets or whatever you call it at the back there. And I also have one for you to pass on to Bruce Sterling, your collaborator, on one of your wonderful uh, books together, which was, of course, The Difference Engine, quite arguably, uh, quite sustainably arguably, the first steampunk work. Uh, we all owe a great debt to that, and a fascinating work about artificial intelligence and Babbage and all of that. Uh, so at the end of the evening, I'll give you one for, uh, to pass on to Bruce as well. But congratulations on your many Aurora nominations and wins, and we're honored to have you here tonight. Um, the book that you're here to talk about tonight, specifically the one that back, back has several of uh, Bill's books at the back and even one or two of mine, but the book we're here to talk about tonight, <laughs> subtle, aren't I, is... Uh, <laughs> It's called uh, Distrust That Particular Flavor. And I want to start off with the title, Distrust That Particular Flavor. Um, because I kept reading, I, I read the entire book, of course, in preparation for this, and kept looking for the reference, and finally came to it. And the sentence actually is, Distrust That Particular Flavor of Italics, referring to certain passages that are emphasized in a science fiction of yore. This, um, this book, although it's nonfiction, is very much in dialogue with the science fiction work that you yourself have produced and has been produced by people who went before you. And I wonder if you want to just talk a little bit about the title and what it was that you are, in fact, telling people to distrust here with this. Well, I, I accepted, unwisely accepted an assignment to write an introduction for a new standard, I think it was actually a Penguin Classics, New Standard British Paperback of The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. And I loved the, you know, I loved The Time Machine. And I thought I could do it. But then I started looking at what those introductions in that series are really like. And they're extremely, you know, really quite academic. And I started trying to put something together. And if it, but I kept, I kept finding that, that my autographic, autobiographical involvement with Wells' novel impinged, uh, I thought, on the, inter the introduction. It, wound up, it always wound up being about me. So eventually I, <clears throat> I told them that, you know, I just said, no, I, I'm, really, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not qualified. Not qualified to do this. But I kept... I kept what I had written and eventually edited it slightly. And my friend Eileen Gunn published it on, on her web magazine. And it was one of the, you know, it was one of the things I thought should, should be in the book. And it, it's, it's an account of my discovery of, of science fiction as, as a child. So, and my simultaneous discovery of the historical fact of the Second World War, and how I, by, because I was reading science in, I was reading in the late 50s science fiction that had been written in the mid 40s, I had to reverse engineer all of modern history in order to, to place Heinlein, say, 
in context of what was real and what he had what he had made what he had made up. And I was doing reasonably well with that, and the Cuban Missile Crisis came along, and. And I was, you know, an imaginative kid who had already read a certain amount of science fiction, and it scared me. It scared me more than anything had ever scared me, and I became absolutely convinced that the world was going, was going to end, you know, right about then, or that I would be forced into one of the new civil defense fallout shelters with my neighbors, who I already thought of as Morlocks. <laughs> <clears throat> and then it, it all reached a kind of unbearable pitch and just evaporated, evaporated overnight. And, and it had a prof that had a profound effect on me. It was a kind of loss of innocence, but in a good way. And I never after that, I never after that trusted the italics and the exclamation points of the, the immediate doomsayers. And so that, you know, when the day after the Y2K bug was supposed to have taken down the entire internet and everything else, there were people coming up to me saying, you never believed it. Why didn't you believe it? And I said, well, I was around for the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that's basically that. You know, Stephen Jay Gould was uh, very much in vogue 20 years ago for a book that he wrote called Wonderful Life, which proposed that if you restarted the tape of life uh, going back to the Cambrian explosion, it would unroll in a very different way from the initial conditions. And uh, I think of you and me as being quite different authors. I mean, I think of you as a friend and a colleague, but we're very different writers. But I was very pleased to read in this that part of what, in that same essay, Got you your start was classic illustrated comic books and indeed the adaptation of H.G. Yes. Wells' The Time Machine, yes. which was absolutely one of the things that got me into this genre too. Mm -hmm. uh, very powerful seed planted there. Indeed. In, indeed. It, it remains, that version of The Time Machine remains very much my by imagery, like if I read the Time Machine yes. now, I, I, I tend to see it in those. Although it was very colored by the time, that edition is very colored by the, that version. The artwork is very colored by the time in which it exists. The Time Machine actually looks like an atom. Yes, it does, exactly. Well, I always thought of it as two hula hoops, which is also of the time in which yes. it was written, uh, mutually perpendicular to each other. Well, or maybe I, three hula hoops, mutually. I secretly, as I say in the essay, I secret, secretly filled the Blue Horse notebooks with, with blueprints for actual time machines. And, and I thought that if you could build something that simultaneously moved in, three dimensions, perhaps you could, you could move in four. It's a wonderful essay, and it touches on a theme that's um, pervasive throughout the collection, which is this notion of whether science fiction writers are actually uh, futurists are actually extrapolating or actually predicting. Uh, I like to say, because sometimes I do business under the rubric science fiction writer and sometimes under the rubric futurist. And the difference is that a good night for uh, giving a talk as a science fiction writer is 500 bucks and a bad night for giving a talk as a futurist is $10,000. So there's a reason to invoke the names. But Wells you give um, a passing grade to because he's so far in the future nobody can gainsay him. It happens that we're speaking here tonight on the 12th of January, uh, 2002, uh, 2012, excuse me, <laughs> I'm slipping decades here, which is the 20th anniversary of the birth of HAL 9000, one of the seminal um, uh, creations in the, the area that you and I both mine in our fiction in very different ways, which is artificial intelligence and, and the World Wide Web. Uh, so I want to talk to you and get, uh, you articulate it well in the book, but for people here who haven't heard you articulate it outside of your fiction, your take on science fiction and prediction. Well, I came, you know, I, I'm, science fiction was my native literary culture. Absolutely, I, you know, I, I was bitten, I was bitten by the science fiction bug long before I was able to read. Because in, in the 50s, life in, in North America was, uh, 
permeated with science fiction imagery, most of which was remarkably upbeat. So I, I thought, I think I probably assumed that the tail fins on my father's Oldsmobile Rocket 88 and the Tom Corbett Space Cadet show that I, I watched every day, I, I thought they were all part and parcel of, of something. And it was something I really liked and I wanted I wanted I wanted more of it, and it it gradually led me to reading actual prose science, you know, adult prose science fiction, and then probably and so I was like a full blown science fiction fan really by age twelve, but by age fifteen, I was I was starting to. I was starting to edge. I was starting to edge away from it. I, uh, puberty had arrived. I was interested <laughs> in other other things, and really, the '60s, what we call the '60s, were was arriving arriving at the same time. So I put away childish things. So I, <laughs> I and I didn't read much science fiction after that. I kept up with a with a few favorite favorite writers. And, you know, something like a decade later, I, I found myself an English major at UB, English honors student at, at UBC, mostly, mostly reading comparative literary critical methodologies and wondering how the hell I was going to be able to make a living because every, Everyone else I'd known at UBC was like signing up with CBC and actually, you know, getting real jobs, and I didn't get that. And, and so I, I thought, well, there's somehow I thought I'd try, I'd try to do, I'd try to do science, do some science fiction. I thought I understood the the entry level mechanism to science fiction better than better than anything else, even though I hadn't. I hadn't really read much science fiction for uh, for a decade, so I I began to try in various ways to see what I could do. I went to science fiction conventions to check out the state of the state of the genre and started, you know, in small ways trying to try to to write fiction. But when I did it, I did it in the mindset of somebody who had been a native science fiction reader who had just spent four years reading about comparative literary critical methodology. <laughs> and one thing, that gave, one thing that gave me was a conviction that historically one reads science fiction of any era as though it were in fact about the era in which it is written. Because, in my opinion, it is. It invariably is. It cannot be about what was the future when it was written, because the uh, the author can you know only can only guess, and that I that was a, a kind of self awareness that I took into my my program of attempting to attempting to write science fiction. That whatever I was going to write was actually going to be about the moment in which it was written, and consequently, the answers to a lot of questions that would turn up in, in the process, the process of, of the narrative, were best found in, by example, in the world around me, rather than in my, in my own imagination. And as I was working my way through as I was writing the early, my early short stories that, from which the world of Neuromancer came, for instance, I took it, I took it for granted that the socioeconomics of the world I was depicting was simply Reaganomics with the volume turned up to 11. 
that, that, you know, the, the world of those stories in the Neuromancer was simply what I got when I ran the tapes on what in those days was very conservative ideology. It no longer is. It, it's now vaguely leftist. But yes. <laughs> And I wound up. I wound up with. I wound up with the sprawl, and it satis It satisfied me because to me it felt. It felt convincing, and I thought that it felt convincing because, its bone structure was drawn on on the world around me, and, for virtually everything in those early books, I either, looked at, looked at my best interpretation of the present, or I looked at my best interpretation of the past. And of, for instance, at the, the criminal under, underworld of, of Neuromancer is based on the, the British Victorian criminal underworld very, very closely, which was actually involved a, a sort of apprenticeship system. It was like a there was like a guild system for for pickpockets and and various various kinds of really esoteric different kinds of burglars. And if you find a you can go and find if you're lucky enough to be able to find a very wonderful wonderful book called The Victorian Underworld by Kello Chesney, you can actually read the the model uh, if you want to, if you wanted to, you could read the model I used for the world that Molly Millions and her her friends come from. And so, I it, it very early for me it, it became more. It was more satisfying for me to use found objects in an imaginative context. Than to sit there, sort of going, ah, oh, what you know, what can I imagine that's far out and trippy? Uh, and I found that what works for me is to find wonderfully strange and trippy things kicking around in a reference library and and recontextualize them in in my narrative, and then I can do my own little bits of imagining. On, on top of that. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned the Neuromancer, of course, which came out in 1984. And I just want you to know all the trouble we went to to make you feel welcome here, because we ordered up a sky that was the color of television tuned to a dead <laughs> channel in honor of your appearance here in Toronto today. The collection is fascinating, because it is your first nonfiction collection, but it covers uh, well over 20 years of material that's been called from Wired and uh, Rolling Stone and you name it, uh, uh, all sorts of different publications, including the Globe and Mail. Um, and uh, you seem to have a, there's a tension, and I very much understand this tension because I made my, my first 10 years of living as a writer, as a nonfiction writer, and segued entirely into doing fiction. You write in the uh, introduction, the itch to become a writer could be scratched, I suspected, too easily with other kinds of writing. Self-discipline, never having been my strong suit, I became uncharacteristically strict with myself about writing only fiction. And there's definitely a, a tension, because each of the essays, uh, may I say to the audience here, is followed with Bill's afterward about why he wrote the essay, how it came to be written, and what he feels about the piece in retrospect, which is a very interesting part of the book. Uh, there's a definite tension here between taking time away from writing the books that you're famous for, the novels that you're famous for, and doing this sort of thing. And I know that in some cases, the temptation is simply somebody is wagging a whole lot of zeros on a check. Uh, and in other cases, it's something you passionately want to talk about. Uh, you're candid enough to say at the end of a couple of the pieces that you think they're actually failures. The H.G. Wells introduction uh, and uh, the piece that you wrote about um, contemporary uh, China. Uh, and that one, fascinates me in particular because you say at the end of it, I think I owe Wired, uh, sorry, Contemporary Japan, excuse me. I think you, I owe Wired a piece about Japan because I kept all the good bits yeah. to use in a novel instead of in the article. So when you sit down uh, to do these nonfiction pieces, just how much of a struggle is it to make that mind space? Uh, and I'm going to say one more thing before I let you speak. 
there's autobiography in here, which you are notoriously uninterested in talking about yourself. Yeah. And there, there's more glimpses of Bill Gibson, the man, in this book than there are, I think, overtly in anything else you've written. Whereas a lot of people say, oh, I know all about Rob Sarg because I read you know, this novel, I know what kind of guy he is. This, is. this is Bill naked on the page here in a way that you aren't in your novels. Well, I was conscious, I was conscious of that in a way every time I wrote one of those one of those pieces. And I, I would look at it and think, well, there's nothing, there's nothing too revealing in, in this Wired article, but were someone to get out the, the cardboard box under my desk and lay these things, lay these things out in a row, it, it would actually produce a kind of, of autobiographical document. So I, I was always aware of that, and I, and I, I thought, you know, fair enough. It's you know it's a, it's you know I can I can live with that and as it turns out I I can live with that I didn't didn't choose to publish everything that it was that was in the cardboard box but not because the things I left out weren't revealing but just because they so strongly suggested to me that I'm not always that good a writer. <laughs> I mentioned uh, Japan in the uh, prelude there last year, uh, a month after uh, the Fukushima meltdown, I went to Japan. And you wrote a very interesting essay about your thoughts about the same time. And it was, of course, one of those moments where science fiction meets science fact and we're having a nuclear disaster and so forth. Um, you often have spoken about Japan and of course set a great deal of fiction in Japan. Um, and I know you're tired of being asked, was Japan still on the cutting edge? But I'm gonna read you a quote and I wanna talk a little bit about this. Uh, the Japanese, this is of course quoting Bill, the Japanese seem to the rest of us to live several measurable clicks down the timeline. The Japanese are the ultimate early adapters and the sort of fiction I write behooves me to pay serious heed to that. If you believe, as I do, that all cultural change is essentially technology driven, you pay attention to the Japanese. There are two interesting things I want to unpack from that. The first is simply the relationship with Japan. And, uh, you know, I do think Canada's a great country to live in, and I don't think it's a coincidence you've picked the place that's closest to Japan where you can live in this country. And the second part I want to unpack is this notion of uh, all um, cultural change being technologically driven, which I think is uh, very much a signature William Gibson approach to viewing civilization. Well, when I began, there were a, a number of things that came together, came together in my life as, as I began to try to write science fiction. One of them was that my wife was actually keeping, keeping a roof over our head by teaching English as a second language at, at the Language Institute at UBC. And she had a, her master's, master's degree in, in linguistics, and she became, she became quite a good, good language teacher. And the, the Language Institute was a serious cash cow for UBC because Vancouver was a place that, that Japanese parents felt more comfortable shipping their, shipping their kids off to, to learn English. So every six months or so, she would get this new batch of mostly Japanese, Japanese kids who spoke relatively little English. And at the end of six months, it was possible to have a sort of conversation with them. And she'd have parties and have them over. And it was, you know, it was a very social, social program. And it fascinated, these kids fascinated me. And I started hanging around with them and, and just garnering bits and pieces of of where they were from, from these astonishing things that that they would they would tell me. And one thing, and sometimes things that they wouldn't tell me, but I would simply infer. For instance, that for them, Vancouver was pretty much like Puerto Vallarta is for me, in terms of of hustle. <laughs> and, you know, it's like you know, Vancouver to them is like like this kind of peri paradise of slack. <laughs> and one, one boy had come back 
for two terms running. He'd been there for a year, and at the end of the year, he was like, he, he sadly said to me, well, I'm going, you know, I'm going home in a few days. I, I, it makes me very sad. And I said, well, would you ever consider staying? And he looked at me with horror, and he said, if I stay any longer, I, I, you know, I'll never get my edge back. <laughs> uh, so I began to I began to like form the kind of my own private private Japan uh, out of out of this stuff and it never it was almost an annoyance to me that Japan became the bubble and the cutting edge and all of that all of that was totally beside the point for me what what I loved about it was just how flaming, weird, and dark, and wonderful, it, it, all, it, all seemed, it all seemed to be. I mean, it, had I known that the bubble would pop, as bubbles always do, I think I would have sort of wanted to fast forward to that, and to what, what, came, what came after it. Like, my fascination with it was never about it being the Sunday supplement flavor of the week. It was about how profoundly strange a place it is. And it's profoundly strange for, I think, for the historical reasons that I touch on in, in a, a couple of the pieces in, in the book, that, that it was the first, it, they had the first military industrial complex in the world. And just prior to that, just prior to that, they, they came out of a, a long period of, of rigidly enforced technological isolation sent a bunch of young noblemen off to England to buy the entire Industrial Revolution kit, ship it back, got it out of the box, blew their brains out. Like, major, major future shock, culture shock, just absolute craziness. They'd never had clock time before. And, and then they had, they had clock time but they had clock time, big time. It made them really. It made them really crazy. They turned in. They they turned into a military industrial state. Conquered as much Asia around them as they could, and then then went and took a took a pot shot at Pearl Harbor, for which they got them got two of two of their cities destroyed by weapons as unimaginable as and incomprehensible as anything. Wells Martians could ever have wielded. And then their conquerors, the Americans, showed up with this like elaborate PowerPoint plan to completely restructure their society from the ground up, which unfortunately was abandoned about 80% of the way through it because the Americans decided they had to go home and fight communism. Uh, and so they left, they left parts of feudal Japan still installed in, in the mechanism, which I think is actually part of the, part of the problem they're having, having today. They never really got to change the whole operating system, system over. And, uh, but they did become this very interesting hybrid. Anyway, I could go on about that forever, but I, I just find that's totally interesting. And whatever happens there now is totally interesting for me because it's always a continuation of that narrative. It can't be anything else. 